You're listening to Top Line Winnipeg with Nick and Jordan Lynham. Welcome back to Top Line Winnipeg. And we got the the regular host back, Jordan Lynham. He's back from Mexico. How, how was the trip, man? Let's get into some. Uh, let's get into some of that. Well, uh, I think it's best we leave that unsaid, but uh, <laughs> we can get into the week. We're gonna have Nick kind of do the heavy lifting for the first few games. First, the most recent game I've caught is the Yotes game. I didn't catch anything for the week before. Yeah, understand. Under- I hope you could understand. Don't <laughs> don't blame me for having too much fun. Okay. Yeah. But uh, from what I can tell on Twitter, it's been quite the week. Lots to talk about. Lots to talk about for a team first in the West in points percentage and winning six or last seven. I'll say that. This yes. Is, <laughs> yes I'm kind of happy I've been away from the noise, so, but uh, l- let's get into it. The first game, I guess, to talk about here would be the first of a back-to-back. Second. Me and Lissa recorded after the Calgary Oh, game. after the Calgary game? Yeah. Yeah, look at me, fake fan of the show. <laughs> so second game to talk about. Another 6-3 game. Both both games are back-to-back. They're 6-3. This one has the Jets beat in the wild. 6-3. This was the big rematch. Um, I don't think there was a fight in this one, was Stanley there? Stanley fought. Um, oh, that's when he had the fake punch. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I saw the video. Break it down for us here. What happened this this night? So, yeah, I was fortunate enough. I bought tickets. I brought Jer with some of the, the Twitter uh, group. Uh, shout out Mike Friesen. You, you want to talk about in-game experience here. Someone get a megaphone in that guy's hand because... He made that group electric. We were up in 3.30, and him and his buddy were getting full-out soccer chants going, making fun of Hartman, making fun of the Wild. It was electric. If we could start getting that going, man, for Tuesday night, a lot of fun, a lot of credit on social media. Game was a ton of fun. The Winnipeg Jets have figured out a power play. The Winnipeg Jets have no... <laughs> Boy, have they. They have a real threat at a power play. What a difference a few weeks makes. What a difference Sean Monaghan makes in this regard. So, this is where you really saw this starting to take off. They get uh, two on the power play in this one. And the biggest thing I'm seeing here, I will get into the power play a bit more, but the Winnipeg Jets had a pretty good start, but it felt like another game where they have a good start and they put, you know, stop the bus. I thought Wild, over the course of that game, were probably the better 5-on-5 team. Specialty teams really made a difference. And the Winnipeg Jets scored goals. Six goals. I mean, we've been begging to see some offense here. Velarde gets two on the power play. Featuring him down low. I can't wait to get into this power play because I really like what I'm seeing. We finally got a goal out of the appleton Lowry nino line. We were were talking about it before you left how we still hadn't got uh, goals out of that line. Me and Liz talked about it. It was Appleton's 300th game, and I actually thought this was one of the better games I've seen out of Mason Appleton. He had a lot of jump in that one. He should have had an assist on his first shift. Brendan Dillon, wide open net, shovels it to the corner. Uh, again, I thought that uh, that Lowry line, I thought this was a staple game for them. <coughs> you got your first Sean Monaghan, 5-on-5 five five goal. Him and Ehlers looked like they were kind of finding something Wait, in this one. He had a Hattie in the Flames games, and they are all power play? Oh, that's a good question, actually. No, they were the 5-on-5 in five there. Two were power play. Good call. Good call. But it was our first time seeing, I think, Monaghan and Ehlers link up on something. They were starting to find some chemistry this week. Then Monaghan kind of missed that game sick on the weekend. Interesting development there. But also, man, the, the Minnesota Wild looked like pretty good. That top line on them destroyed. Our top line. In, they in have minutes. been kind of buzzing. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're jumping their way up the standings right now. I think they're in the in the race for that eight spot right now. So let me pitch this to you. So here's where it got really concerning. The Jets were, Jets were up 5-1 in this one, but it didn't feel like a 5-1 game. So it's always good. You take advantage, get opportunities. But then they really felt like they were going to blow it in the back 10 in that game. Like it was all the Minnesota Wild. Back-to-back shifts, and we're going to get into this line later. But back-to-back shifts... The Connor, Shifley, and it turned out to be Aya Fallow, which is another aspect I want to talk about. Velarde's getting pulled off late in games as a defensive replacement for Alex Aya Fallow. That line gave up the Marco Rossi goal, and then the very next shift, they give up a partial break. It could have been 5-4 with like four, three, four minutes left. That game was a lot closer than the score indicated. There was Con- Connor Hellebuck, man. He really bailed them out down the stretch of that one. 
So there's some concerns there. But they put up six goals. They got offense from two of their lines at 5-on-5. They got the power play going. They get the win. No rough stuff. Did surprise me a little bit. I thought someone would kind of scrap Hartman early and just call it quits. But, you know, there was business to take care of, especially coming off of that 6-3 game. Let, let's leave it there for that wild game. I'll say this, though. The Winnipeg Jets are first in points for, or per, points percentage in the West. The Wild are creeping into that wild card spot. How fun would that series be? That's, that's the one you want. That, you have to, in the position the Jets are in right now, and the way the Pacific is lining up, mm-hmm. winning the West means so much. Mm-hmm. Because if you let the, the Canucks win the West, or who else is up there? Is the, the Oilers are up there? No, they've kind of fallen off. Well, it doesn't matter. Whoever wins the West gets the eighth seed. And that's going to be the team from the Central. I'll, I'll also make a note. I'm pretty sure this is the this this is the game we end up seeing Cole Perfetti get the motor from. Just to touch on that, we had seen a stretch. Me and Lissa talked about it where this top six was getting absolute. It's hard to call it a top six when the Larry line plays second line, but yeah, just because yeah, most yeah. people see it as a top six. Me and Liz had a conversation about how both lines, like the focus, is on the top line just because it plays so much. This was another game in a row where both lines got destroyed at five on five. To put some numbers behind it, Ehlers, Monahan, Perfetti, under 25% in expected goals against. Connor Shifley, Velarde, under 20%. So it was another game where the questions had arisen about the mix up there. And we lead into the Chicago game where we see Monahan get sick. Vladin Mastikov jump up with Ehlers and Ayafalo, I believe. And Perfetti ends up on that fourth line. Or do I have that mixed? No. Monahan uh, played that game. Sorry. Monahan played. Monahan played. He didn't play Arizona. Correct. A lot going on this week. <clears throat> um, so, that yeah, We move into that that uh, Blackhawks game. A 3-2 overtime win. The Nick Ehlers game? You have to call it the Nick Ehlers game. A lot of noise in the market. A lot of trade-em stuff, which I think is just absolutely idiotic at this point. Puts, puts the team on his back with two absolute highlight real goals. And then the other way, though, and I think he's played some decent hockey in the games he's gotten into recently. Logan Stanley was like a big. Remember, remember last year when the conversation was kind of like, Billy Hanlon was doing a lot of good things, but you can't make that big mistake. Logan Stanley made that big. That's mistake been in that his. Game. That's his career. It, yeah. The 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 Logan Stanley, and we've talked about this and said this exact thing I'm about to say here. But he's just been so misused in throughout his career. He's been that big mistake guy with the offensive zone upside. Yeah, and he's looked at and they look at him the complete opposite way. The Logan Stanley thing is so baffling to me, where that's the point where I think if he goes to another team that knows how to use him correctly, he might be a a very serviceable third pairing guy. I think that's fair. Just Winnipeg is not that like he doesn't get used properly, and it it just doesn't work here. It doesn't, And and he makes those mistakes often. You can't avoid them. And and on Stanley's part, I do think there is an aspect to. It's just better for both the organization and the kid's career. Because, it, like you're right, he, he he's in Winnipeg with the first round tag, traded up for. He's going to be this Zed Nochara was the expectations in this market. Canadian buff. Or not Canadian. Yeah, there Canadian were some buff, people yeah. who were saying that. I do think you get a change of scenery there. All of a sudden, he, the expectations are a little different. You get a new set of eyes there. I, I could see a serviceable third pair. I, I'm just not overly confident in it. But he, he, this game really turns around for Chicago when he blindly throws a puck from the blue line and then gets burnt up the ice. Chicago scores. 2-1 game. And then late in the third, to his credit, maybe an iffy call. But he's not a guy that's getting many benefits of the doubts from refs. Tripping. And Chicago's just all pressure from there. Ends with a gold mouth scramble. Neil Pionk flicks it out. Nick Ehlers tries to dive to poke it out. Game goes, tie game, we go to overtime, where Kyle Connor scores the winner after a night what which might have been his worst we've seen in some time. That line again at five on five, absolutely dominated by the Chicago Blackhawks. And the scary thing about this game is like they win this game three two, and it's the Chicago Blackhawks. They were outplayed for a majority of this game again. Like they're winning. That's this is where this conversation is going to be interesting this week, because they get the two points. 
Con- they shut down Connor Bedard, which I think there's a lot of credit in that aspect. Connor Bedard did not do much for the Chicago Blackhawks, but it's just like, what is going on here? The Lowry line struggled. It was really Nick Ehlers making two big league plays, and then all Chicago, like Connor Hellebuck, was a big reason they beat the Chicago Blackhawks in overtime. It, fe- it feels weird, like. Like, I haven't obviously seen or didn't watch those games. I saw the highlights. But it feels like this team is almost an inverse from what it was four weeks ago. Yeah. Like, when was the the back-to-back Leafs games where the Jets played without some of their star players, worked the Leafs for 60 minutes, and ended up losing overtime? Yep. It was a, The Jets just couldn't score for, what, two, three weeks? We had, what, seven goals over five games at one point? Yep. Now, it seems that the play is kind of deteriorated deteriorated but the great equalizer score goals and the Jets seem to be doing that in bunches again the power play um the next game on the schedule there was Arizona what a great start to to the power play that game gave Velarde down low as a magician between that pass to Connor on the power play and then the uh the fake cut out front deke back to the back end Mm -hmm. he is so good down low so let's 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 talk about it here uh, Mark Shifley takes advantage of the play early in that one. Iffy on the goaltender. Good on Shifes to Barry. So that there's a five-on-five five goal for for that top line. Yep. Though, like, I mean, it's not like... Mark Shifley looked very good in that first period. I agree. We were texting about this. I was at the game. Uh, Wasak night. I, I enjoyed it. I saw there were some cl- complaints and stuff. I enjoyed it. They had a band in house. Had some special guests. They, got a, they had a DJ in house for in-game music now. So it was actually like a, a pretty lit game. I think that's the first Wasak night I haven't been to in years. But I'll say this. I think what was disappointing about that night, the crowd was buzzing early, and this team got gets outplayed by the Arizona Coyotes men. Like, yeah. They caught well, on 11 games in a row losing. I think they dominated the first. Well, dominate might be strong. They, they were definitely a better team in the first. Yeah. And then the, the second and the third was just slowly and slowly falling apart. For their third time in four games, they blew a multi-goal lead. And look at the teams we're playing in this stretch. Yeah. Are those teams that you think you should be giving up multi-goal leads to? Nope. But, yeah, so they have the, the big first. Shifley gets on the board early. And you texted me while I was at the game, and I did agree with you in the first. It felt like Mark Shifley was willing that line to the ozone. He was doing everything he can to get something going on that line. The other parts are just disconnected. We'll get into that in a bit. Um, Nick Schmaltz answered on the power play. The PK still still is kind of struggling to get there. You're seeing, you're seeing when teams get moving. Like the one thing we talk about the Jets is creating movement. The Jets seem slow to the slow to the reaction on the PK. It's like the opposite problem they had on the power play. They're getting exposed by that on the PK a little bit. It's so baffling to me too, because <laughs> it was a it was a very good penalty kill last year. Yeah. Same coaching, same same everything. Like what? It, it doesn't make sense. And then the power play comes up back to back big. Again, what a treat it is to have a power play that's not like gonna depress you. We went through a one for thirty three stretch and now we're what, seven of the last fifteen or something like that? Yeah, we're due for another stretch. <laughs> but I actually feel it's real. And even without Monahan for the last game, you could see that teams are pre scouting what's been working since Monahan jumped into it. Because Alex Alfell is nowhere near the, the bumper threat Monahan is. But no one knew Monaghan wasn't playing until warm-up. And you could tell that the Arizona Coyotes were coached to take away that option, right? Monaghan comes into that Calgary game, scores three big goals. Two of them in, the, in that bumper spot on the power play. And it's really opened things up. So one of the big problems I had with this power play before, and we talked about it at length. It was going to start at Mark Shafley. It was going to go up to Josh Morrissey. It was going to go over to Kyle Connor, and he was either going to rip a one-timer or it was going to go back up to Morrissey, back to Shafley. And and teams weren't moving. Like, no one no one was scared about the outside threats. What Sean but, Monahan's – go for it. No, never, I was, never mind. What Sean Monahan's allowed this team to do is, especially since that Calgary game, it, teams are now pulling the top guy near Shafley and the bottom D towards – Mark uh, Sean Monahan, which is opening up all this room for Gabe Lardy down low. And now it's crazy. We, we talk about comparing our power play to that 17-18 one, right? And obviously you had Blake Wheeler at his peak of his prime. You had Shifley in the bumper. You had line A shot, which could score from anywhere. You had buff shot that can score from anywhere. And Kyle Connor was down low as a sneaky threat. 
So the one thing we talked about, it was impossible for teams to defend that because everywhere you went, there was a scoring option. That power play was so lethal. And now working between the triangle of Mark Shifley, Sean Monaghan, and Gabe Velarde, and going and working from it low has kind of created a similar impact. Though it's harder for Josh Morrissey to become an option when it's down at Gabe Velarde because you're passing through everybody else. When it gets down to Velarde, his hands and feet are so good with finding pucks that he's always a threat. Between shielding the puck when he's driving for a goal, like the, the goal he scores with the, the dangle. That's a that's elite stuff. Like, how do you defend that? This is just a big man going in the net and has great hands. He could, he could dangle in a phone booth, no problem. But if teams do go to that, you got Sean Monaghan in, th- in the bumper. You have Shifley coming down. And the biggest part, and it's still getting going, and we saw one of these goals on uh, s- Sunday. Kyle Connor weak side. Bingo. Kyle Connor is at his absolute best when he can get lost, when teams forget about him and he can find that empty space. And Gabe Velarde is a good enough passer where, hey, th- teams get drawn into what's going on. Kyle Connor is going to get a lot more opportunities from closer to the net than where he's shooting from now, and he's going to finish those, bar none. Like, no matter what we're going to talk about later with Kyle Connor, that is where he's at his best. So it's created way more options that are threats. Now I'm curious to see what happens when teams adjust to it, but it feels real and it feels very hard to defend against. What do you think? Well, like again, I only caught the one game where, without – uh, Monahan, so it will be interesting to see it go forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do agree with the what you're saying about Kyle Connor on the offside. Oh, man. When you're watching it, bef- like thinking back to three weeks ago, um, those of you who are familiar with local hockey rings, Kyle Connor was ripping one timers from the ring out line and above. I know they don't have that line on the ice, but you know what I'm saying. Like he was ripping him from far away. He doesn't have that shot power. It it, it wasn't fooling goalies. Mm-hmm. But you look at the Velarde pass to him against Arizona, he's in the circle. And that's a much higher percentage chance for an elite goal scorer like he is to finish. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's super interesting. I I do want to see what it looks like with Monahan. Like, I'm still interested to see how he fits into it. Mm-hmm. Like, just if he's that big of a threat, the teams are going to him. Because, like, I personally don't think of Monahan as a, a threat in the slot, but maybe he's a guy like I, I haven't seen enough. Yeah. You're and gone. You're gone. Not enough good things to say about Gabe Velarde. Um, he was definitely the highlight of that first period on the power play for me. Obviously, both those two goals were directly off of his stick. So it, it's going to be interesting. I'm not as worried about the Morrissey not being able to become a threat as much Agreed. because he's the least dangerous threat on that. He he is the least dangerous threat as it is, yeah. and it's it's your D man that's standing at the top. Like it's unless you have a Dustin Bufflin, he's gonna or Kale McCarr or. Yeah. Quinn Hughes, he's not going to be that guy. Like it's, He's a very good defenseman, but it's it's not the moment for him to shine, at least this year. Uh, it is what it is. But uh, it was definitely a sight for sore eyes for me on Sunday as I was laying there half awake watching that game, recovering from my flight. But, yeah, dude, it was, it was nice to see. Yeah, and everyone is well aware of my opinions of the Monaghan trade at this point, but I actually give him a ton of credit for this shift in this power play. Because I know you were gone, but it is so evident when you're watching this that he draws attention. And I think a lot of it was him breaking out in that Calgary game, scoring from that area. But now, like, teams are forced to respect that, and it's opened up that low. I'm curious to see how long that goes, but I do think he deserves a ton of credit for this working out. And I even said the list last week. It adds a lot of value to that trade. If, if he, It makes or breaks it. Correct. correct. Well, I, what I said was, if... He's the reason that this becomes a top uh, half of the league power play. It's worth the first alone. Regardless of the 5-on-5 five five stuff, where I still do have some concerns, if, he, if this power play was so bad in killing this team that that impact alone, I don't even give a shit about the first. I really don't if, if this is real. like That's where my bar is at this point. We'll see what else they're able to do at the deadline, which was the other aspect of my opinion. But he is very clearly fixed or – at least in this last week and a half, fix this power play. And there were signs of him, Iofalo, and Monaghan really did look pretty good together against Chicago. One game sample, Chicago. Also, it was Perfetti's first game on the fourth line with the Meskov and Baron. That line was pretty good, too. It was the top six that got absolutely hammered against Chicago again. But so the Jets leave the first period 
up 3-1. Two power play goals plus Shifley getting that bank off the wall. And then again, this team just sits back. Arizona controlled the rest of that hockey game. And it starts with a 3-2 game when uh, Matthias Maselli hems in the top line. A minute of 30 where they're just skating around against the top line and the top pairing of the Winnipeg Jets. Or was it the Pionk Dillon pairing? Whatever. It was one of the top four pairings and the Shifley line. And it was just stick checks. There was no commitment to making any kind of play on a body or an actual play on a puck. It was just, it looked like a power play for a penalty kill. And it's a it's a 3-2 hockey game. And you look at that, and at that point, yes, Mark Shifley has a goal. Kyle Connor has a goal. Gabe Velarde has a goal. At 5-on-5, five five, that line is 1-1 one, one against the Arizona Coyotes after that. And what I kept seeing, and this is where I find it baffling, we'll get into this conversation starting here. The conversation has been, oh, this top line is gaining, gaining chemistry. At the game, being there, all I saw from the top line at 5-on-5 five five is every time they got into the op- opposition zone, Arizona got on one of the guys pretty quick, and it was going the other way. Like, there was just nothing being creative created. Nick Schmaltz ties this one early in the third. Connor Halbach keeps this team, brings this team to overtime. And Kyle Connor does what Kyle Connor does. It was so painfully obvious how this game was going to end. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I texted Nick uh, in a group chat <laughs> we're in with a couple of buddies there. We're about five minutes left in the third. And I regret not tweeting it just so I could look smart. But I said, Kyle Connor scoring this OT winner. You can bank on it. Take it to the bank. It doesn't matter. That's how the game's ending. Yep. It's, it's That's where he's the great equalizer in this. I, I completely agree with... Um, the concerns on the five on five, but man, when it feels like we're going in overtime, if he gets a puck, it feels like this game's probably over. For, for sure. So let's let's go right into it. Fun overtime to be there to watch. Sean Dursey, what a move! He made Morrissey look silly. Big save from Hellbuck. Two Coyotes run into each other, and you knew it was game over at that point. The crowd was standing. It was cool. It was a standing O as yeah. the play developed. Kyle Connor ends it from Josh Morrissey. Mark Shifley. Morrissey, big week, by the way. Nine points. Nine assists of, what, four games? Yeah. <laughs> he but, is, how, how he's become underappreciated again is absurd to me. And it feels like no one's talking about Josh Morris anymore because he's not putting up 75 points. And, oh, this would have been while you're gone, too, because me and Liz got into it. ESPN was pulling anonymous players and GMs, and the Josh, Josh Morrissey disrespect really bothered me because I'm a guy that I said last year, Halfway through the year, he's a, he's a Norris ballot type of guy. And I felt his game kind of fell off as the season got harder. And I was totally cool with him not being rated top 10. The version of Josh Morrissey we're seeing, and now the offense is coming with it, sign me up. Though I do find it interesting, I said this with Liss, I, thought, I saw this in the Vancouver game, I'm seeing it a little bit more. It does seem like they're struggling a little bit more against cycle stuff. And we'll see what happens there. I'm curious about the Jets decor over the next two weeks, honestly. So we leave this game. And Arizona was the better team at 5-on-5. Five five. We're winning games off the PP and Connor Hellbuck, which are huge. We know we have the best goal in the league. He's showing why he should probably get heart votes at this point. He's, he's, he's number five for me on the ballot right now. Yeah, I'll put it that way. Behind the big four guys that are having, hundred. He's yeah. never gonna win. The, the the heart race this year is incredible. Yeah. If you love hockey, you gotta love this heart race this year. For sure. For me, Connor Halbach's number five. I got Cooch one right now. I got Am McJesus Mac. That is my my list. And then I go Halbach five. But he's really like earning it over the last two weeks. I know there was some talk about, oh, it's a system now, or whatever. Connor Halbach is is carrying this team over this stretch. And now the PP is going. So we're getting some goals from the PP. But like you just said, it feels like the inverse of what this team was until Kyle Connor got back. This team before was just dominating teams at 5-on-5. Specialty teams were killing them in those one-goal games. But they were rolling through teams 5-on-5. Since they were at 5-on-5, they were about a 60% goals for a team. So they were winning games 6-4 for every 10 goals at 5-on-5. Since Kyle Connor got back, what do you think this team is at goals for it versus against at 5 5? It was at 60 40. I'm going to guess for the fun of it, 49 51. It's even lower than 49. We're in the mid 40s right now over this stretch. 
And this is where this conversation gets interesting. And I think a lot of people are missing a lot of points. So we're going to try and have this unfold. Okay. And just keep in mind, we just spent five minutes going over how well that these three particular players have clicked on the power play. 100%. There is so much important nuance to this conversation that 100%. most people that I've seen talk about it are completely missing. Yes. So I just want to point that out before we get into anything because these are three of the team's most important players. 100 percent. Three of the three of the five or six most important guys on the ice. 100%. So before any freakouts, that is the the <laughs> intro to this segment. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> he knows the Twitter heat's Be- coming. <laughs> oh, I just a I lot know. of the shit I've read just hurts my head. Yeah. Because everything is so cut and dry, and there's there's no room. The for character trouble. limits and like the the whole forum of it doesn't make for good conversations in general. That's what we're here for, baby. But it's it just hurts. Like I've, it's just hurt me to read some of these things lately. So let's let's talk about it. So we leave the Arizona game, four three win. The top line all plays twenty plus minutes. The top line of Mark Shifley, Kyle Connor, and Gabe Lardy factor in on every goal. This is undisputed, right? We're not we're not disputing this. Now, when you break that down to game state, they were one one at five on five, so they break even. Everything else came at. Power play and three on three. There is not a single person I've seen having these discussions that suggests Kyle Connor should be removed from the power play or removed from playing in the overtime. I'm quite happy to see Kyle Connor and Mark Shifley starting overtime over the Larry Appleton stuff we were seeing earlier in the year. They should start overtime every game. 100%. But when you break a hockey game down to game state, how are people still making the case that because they scored four goals, you got to keep them as your first line playing this many minutes. Because this is what it looks like at 5-on-5. Five five. For Kyle Connor, Mark Shifley, and Gabe Velarde, in 113 minutes together this year, they are tied 7-7. Seven, seven. For a top line, you can't have that. Not a top line of a best uh, team in a conference. You cannot go 7-7 seven, seven of even strength and hope that you win down the lineup and hope that you win on special teams. You can't. This is These are the guys playing a third of the minutes in a game. About a quarter of that is going to be 5-on-5. Five five. That's a fuck ton of ice time, right? Now you want to break that down for uh, even further. If you're just looking at shot attempts, which it's still a small sample size, shot attempts tend to be better. They're getting outshot at 137 to 103. Good enough for 42.9%. In that span, if you if you factor that out to per 60, like that played out over a course of a game, they're generating 54 and they're letting up 72. Expected goals in their time together, they're expected to score four and they're expected to give up seven. So they've given up seven, they're outscoring their And they're, their they're metrics. always going to outscore their metrics. Likely, absolutely. In that span, for every 60 minutes that this line plays hockey together, you would expect that they would give up four goals for every two and a half they score. You cannot have that on a Stanley Cup contender. What's the one thing I keep talking about is games 82 plus matter the most. I don't give a shit about a soft schedule against Chicago, Arizona, Calgary, Minnesota, Minnesota, San Jose. And they lost every single matchup. Here was their head-to-head results in those five games. Again, these are not powerhouses. Their best game came against Vancouver. 45% against Vancouver. Which is still not good enough because that's a team that you very well might have to go through. You, you're, There's a very good chance game 82 this year is for first in the West. 100%. Between the Jets and Vancouver. What did they look like against Calgary, Minnesota, Chicago, and Arizona? 20% against Calgary. 18% against Minnesota. Chicago, 27%. Arizona, 285 Yes, these three guys are massive to the W's they've put up, and yet they are costing this team at 5-on-5. Both of these things could be absolutely true. So this idea that they have to stay together at 5-on-5 because the PP is working or they're scoring in overtime, does that mean Sean Monaghan should get taken off the power play one to play with Nick Ehlers on PP2? Because it's working? (laughs) Because we got to keep... Like, it makes no sense to me. And what's the solution, Nick? You're going to have... You're going to talk about this. What's the solution? 
Let's compare that. What's the line that we've been saying we saw that we want to see again? Euler, Shafley, Velarde. Euler, Shafley, Velarde. Let's compare. In 166 minutes together, so there's 50, 50 minutes extra. They're outscoring teams 15 to 4. Their shots attempts metrics are 207 4, 160 against. What a. So that's, it, that's a 70 shot difference. So how many? For fif- good. 50 minutes more? 50 minutes more. So that's 50% more essentially. They've scored double the goals and given up half. Yeah. Yeah. Great way to put it. And if you want to look at the expected metrics, they are out, they too are out, ex, outscoring their expected goals. As they're going to. Yep. 10.3. Their expected goals against is the exact same 7.2 as the other line's done in 50 less minutes. So you're getting more offense. You're giving up way less defensively. You're outscoring your opposition. You're outshooting your opposition. You're out chancing your opposition. Why can we not have that line of five on five, which is extremely success- successful, and his team is struggling to generate at five on five, and still keep the power play and the three on three the way it is? I don't get why people are having trouble coming around on this idea that the top line is doing everything, so you can't break them up. When at five on five, that is not true. They are spending entire games in their own zone and getting opt- hoping to get opt- optimi- opportunistic the other way. It's the same thing that we've seen with the the Wheeler line for years. It's 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 basically the exact same scenario. Um, and the thing is, well, the reasoning I don't think it's going to change is because the third line is the second line, and they're not going to play less than sixteen minutes a night, and. There's a case to be made that for Kyle Connor, which you could make for Nick Ehlers, is that you can't be playing a player like that 14 or less minutes a night, which is true. I agree. I don't think Kyle Connor should be playing the same amount of minutes Nick Ehlers is playing right now. I think they they both should be playing 16 to 18 each on on different lines, obviously. But that that I believe in my heart that that's the reason is because they think Nick Ehlers is more expendable. And they don't want to change the situations to where Kyle Connor is playing 14 minutes a night. It all stems from that usage of the Lowry line, I think. Which is insane. Which which is insane. You are trying to build a Stanley Cup contender. You should not be building your your you should not be optimizing your ice time around a line that doesn't provide offensively what you can be providing offensively. And I want to touch on this because I think this gets blown way too far out. I've been accused of saying some pretty idiotic things that haven't come out of my mouth. Kyle Connor is still a big piece of this roster. One of the biggest. He is a core member of this roster. We're not asking to sit him in the press box because I got accused of that. We're not asking him not to play hockey for this team. We're not asking to strip him off the power play. We're asking to use him properly. Even to add more credence to what the Jets have been without Connor versus with. Without him, expected goals. Per 60. 2.654, 2.2 against. When you have Connor Halbuck, you'll take those metrics. All day. And that's when they were 82% of games, point percentage. Since he came back and they use that line and that line gets hemmed in, here's the Jets as a whole. 2.85 expected goals, 4 per 60, 3.04 against. They're getting play, outplayed at 5-on-5 five five with Connor taking those minutes. This isn't... This isn't Kyle Connor isn't good. This is he has his shortfalls and deficiencies, and you should hide them by playing him against lesser competition and allow him to get more offensive opportunities on a line that you're only using in the ozone. And we're talking about making him a second line player. Yeah. That's all it is. One step down the lineup. That's all it is. Um the the, the one example I know that we've mentioned multiple times on this podcast is the Jonathan Huberto example. Jonathan Huberto had how many 100-point seasons playing on a second line? That There is a recipe for successor. And then look at how he's done in Calgary since. Can, can you believe that Jonathan Huberto played five-on-five five minutes on a second line and still was on the power play one? And was one of the most effective... You're allowed to do that? Was one of the most effective... Was he a winger? Huberto's a winger, yeah. yeah. One of the most effective wingers in the league playing on a second line. And- it, it just... It baffled... Like, you would think that this... And there is some people I've seen that take it too far and, the, oh, we suck because of him. It's not He's not the one putting himself out there, Correct. for one. Correct. For one. This is this is a Correct. coaching issue that we have. And 
for all the amazing things that Bonus has done, this is a shortfall. We've mentioned multiple times, every coach has their shortcomings. No coach is perfect. Yep. Some are just more frustrating than others. Yep. But we're talking about demoting a guy three minutes a night, four minutes a night. No, no, three minutes a night, probably max. Onto a second line where you still have multiple time chances to score. You'll still have multiple, in theory, multiple shifts in the ozone. You'll still get your power play. You'll still start overtime with Shife. Like there's, the only conversation is whether he's beside fifty five at regulate or five on five or not, and he shouldn't be. And it's we have seven years of. Post-2018, when Blake Wheeler drove the bus and put them on his back and said, okay, guys, we're an elite first line, it's been gar- it, it's been not good. Here's the thing. When you look at playoffs and people wonder why we're so upset about this, can, can, you want to you wanna make me optimistic? It's your turn to do some research. You want me to change my tune? Find me a single Stanley Cup winner. That has won a cup with a first line that's been scored all regular season. Find me one. Because that is what has been true for Mark Shifley and Kyle Connor as a first line in every single season since the Western Conference Finals. If, if, if a cup is the goal, it doesn't work. If, if, and it seems like on social media there is, if all you want is to be able to say you have a 40-goal scorer, all-star, uh, his points matter more than everything else. Go ahead. Be a, be, you could be a Kyle Connor fan. I'm a Kyle Connor fan. As hard as it is to believe because of my stance on the idea he should be put in a better su- position to succeed so the whole team could succeed because I want the Winnipeg Jets to succeed. It, it, it blows my mind that it's seen as negative to want the Jets to play a line that was elite. That was one of the best in the league. It's not like we're like, oh, we got to blow this thing up. You had an option that was the best in the league for a month and a half. You went on an 82% points percentage on the back of this line. It's not like, oh yeah, the Jets are terrible now. This is still a good hockey team. We want to see this team go on a deep run. And you're not going to do it with Kyle Connor and Mark Shifley on the first line. It's not going to happen. It, it doesn't work. It hasn't worked. And it's where I think we're going to see a lot of it. Um, a lot of it, I think, stems from the organizational thing. I mean, we've talked about this a bunch already, but like the the Dreger quote when when that line was buzzing and Connor wasn't even back yet about how the org can't wait to uh, to put him back on that line. This has been coming. This is probably going to be here for the year. I don't expect changes. Like I, I, it would take a lot, a lot, especially with the team winning right now. Like it would take a lot for that line to change. It's not. I don't foresee it happening. It's just it's it's frustrating. It's it's very frustrating. It's one of the it's one of the few places that I just struggle with some of Bones' decision making. And again, I think he's done a lot well this year. Hundred percent. And it's time to talk about Rick Bonus. Because this is a guy we prided on changing the culture of this team. This is a guy we've we've talked up the system. We know when this team plays the system, they are one of the toughest outs. But the one thing we both really gave him credit for was accountability. And this idea he was going to be honest with the media, this idea he was going to be forthcoming, this idea he was going to hold players 1 through 23 on the lineup to the same standards, it's time to, it's time to expose a, a double standard because he has handled the media poorly the last 10 days. Poorly. So while this top line has been struggling, it's been a common question. Well, why do you not try and get both lines going? By flipping Nick Ehlers for Kyle Connor. Because both lines were struggling. It wasn't even just the top line. Both lines were struggling. And Rick Bonus originally leaned on the idea that it would mean Cole Perfetti would have to play the right wing. And he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to put Cole Perfetti on the right wing. Nine days later, where's Cole Perfetti playing tonight? Fourth line right wing. Fourth line right wing. So so that option is now available, right? No, no, no. IXL Fowl is going to play that right wing. We're going to try this out. How did it go from... That nine days ago, as the reason you can't get more out of your top line, to nine days later, oh, no, he's going to – not only is Cole Perfetti playing the right wing, he has to play it to keep a job. Yeah, he's clearly – nine days. He's clearly lost trust in him. And to to Bones um, 
let's get save the cold profetti stuff because this okay. is the bone double okay. standard here. So we went from right wing was the thing holding them back from trying this. Clearly bullshit. You don't switch that entire mindset in nine days. It's a bullshit answer. I don't like to be bullshit. I'm going to be flat out here. I'm going to tell you how it is. I don't like to be bullshitted. We also saw uh, the Calgary game week where Bones absolutely annihilated Ehlers and Perfetti in the media because they're spending too much time in their D zone. Their minutes are continuing to go down. Um, they, they can't be playing that far back. Do you know what he said when asked the same question about Mark Scheifele, Kyle Connor, and Gabe Lardy yesterday? Well, there's defense on the ice too. Yeah, it's not just on the three forwards. The, the, the D got to be back there too. What? This is what... You want to talk about continuing on this team culture? I thought Murat wrote a great article about the dangers of having double standards and what this could lead to both for Nick Ehlers' future, Cole Perfetti's future, but this organization's future. You can't have double standards like that in the media where you're going to go at every corner and protect these guys and actually play them more despite getting hemmed in, but you're going to punish other guys for it. You, you can't have this within a team. What message does it send? Yeah, though those two scenarios in specific are pretty pretty bad looks. Within within nine days of each other. And this is my issue with it. This Winnipeg Jets team is a good hockey team. Kevin Sheldayoff's done his job. He needs to go get one more piece at least. But he's done his job at oh, this point. At least. They're shopping. They have to. We'll get into that in a second. This is on Rick Bonus to figure out. He, he doesn't have a handle on this roster right now. As much good as he's done, he's resorted against his his key principles. He either is not watching. Which he obviously is. Which he obviously is. Or he's bullshitting every single fan with every single quote protecting this. When he himself has made this a core belief for getting ice time. Full stop. Mm-hmm. And then you hear people... This is my, my, my troubles with it, is when you have people in positions then shitting on fans who see this and making excuses for bonus. We're hearing, oh, it, it, Nick Ehlers might be still hurt. Okay, he was playing 14 and a half when he was healthy. That is not a reason why this is happening. Yeah, the... That is, that is bullshit. Like, we don't have to twist ourselves in our knot to justify everything Rick Bonus is doing. It's offensive. It really is. You're shitting on people that see through this bullshit by trying to mask what's going on here. Yeah. And that's driven me crazy this week. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a frustrating standard. It's going to be uh, very interesting to see how the next week or two play out because obviously leading into the deadline, I, I don't expect a line change. I don't think you do oh, either. Not coming no, no chance. He's going to sink this ship with it. Do you want to do you want to get into the Cole Perfetti thing? Because I think that's an interesting conversation. Let's have some Cole Perfetti stuff. Because, like, yeah, we're both huge fans of Cole Perfetti. Yep. In how many situations does a six or twenty one year old with one point in his last sixteen games not get demoted? Totally fair. I I don't like I know is up a lot of people are quick to get up in arms. I think Cole Perfetti's a hell of a hockey player. I know you think Cole Perfetti's a hell of a hockey player. Mm-hmm. I know offensive moments are where he shines. But at the end of the day, he's got one point in 16 games. I don't blame. Again, that's a standard thing, though. That is. Yeah, that's absolutely a standard thing. But who's going to get. We are a little naive thinking that he's going to hold everyone to the same standard. No coach in the history of hockey does. There, no, but there's... he's proud and no, pride I, no, I, I know, I know. But. You're naive buying that. I I was naive buying that. No coach is going to hold your 30-year-old face of the franchise to the same standard as your 21-year-old up-and-coming player. Yep. It's just that is the way hockey folks think. That's the way it goes. And he's had one point in his last 16 games. I don't blame him for getting the demotion there, yep. especially when I follow comes up and that second line clicks. Yep. Well, then now he's really fucked. Now, Sean Reynolds went on Winnipeg Sports Talk the other day. I think it was yesterday, it might have been the day before, mm-hmm. talking about how we might start to see Cole Perfetti scratches coming. Mm-hmm. Because some games, Rick's going to want that fourth line doing something. Some games going to want him doing others. That's where I think the Cole Perfetti conversation gets interesting. 
Not whether he's on the fourth line, it's whether he's scratched or not. What do you what do you see there? And then I have a follow up. Yeah, I'm just gonna throw a little stat in here, just like for the double standard conversation. Mason Appleton is one minute behind the NH- the Winnipeg Jets. I know ice time leaders oh. when trailing games. One minute, he has one goal in his last ten games. I saw that. Rick Bonus does not have a handle on what. His be- his guys are best at. I'm sorry. That one baffles me. The uh, the Appleton thing is insane. The use the usage one down in games is the one the one thing I I don't think I'll ever be able to truly understand. Yeah. Like you can rationale a lot of things that hockey folks do. Like oh it's, oh, it's it's this or and it's things that have been around forever. Like the like the Perfetti thing getting sent or demoted. Like it. On 32 teams in the NHL, if you're 21 years old and you're struggling, you're getting demoted. No, for sure. I don't – yeah. Like, you can understand that yeah. if you've been around the game long enough or yeah, yeah, follow yeah. game enough. Yep. I can't rationale that line playing the most minutes when trailing in games. It's nuts. It's, it's your least offensively gifted line. If you take Nino Nino right off that line, there's, a, there's about no offense on that line. Mm-hmm. So, on yeah. the Colbert Fetty thing, though – because I do think it's a fair topic, and it's something I actually nailed last week with Liss. I said, I think we're going to see Cole Perfetti playing with Nemesikov. I had the other ringer wrong. I had it as I follow. Because those, they did play shortly earlier this year, and they put up some really good results. And I do think there's a very real positive with Perfetti playing with Nemesikov. They've worked together in the past. Nemesikov does a lot of the little things beside Perfetti. And I do think it adds a layer to the depth of this team, to be quite honest. Um, they looked good in Chicago. They played with Barron, um, who he's been a constant on that line. Now it didn't look nearly as good with Rasmus Kupari, though. I don't even think we're talking about an NHL player anymore when it comes to Rasmus Kupari. He's just out there doing cardio. Yeah, he might be a filler at the deadline. If you can get something for him, just honestly, who do you have ahead, him or Gus? Probably Gus. I'd lean Gus too. Um, so I have no problem. With Cole Perfetti getting into motion, said it last week. If he's playing on a fourth line with the Meskov, I think it makes some sense right now. Get him going again. Try and work it out. I do have an issue with the lack of latitude in Rick Bonus's lineup that there's like three positions that can move. Connor and Scheif are locked in together. Mm-hmm. Ehlers and Monahan are now locked in together. That. Whole line. Well, Larry line will never change. Living off a strong fall, basically. Yes. And Nemeskov and Barron are locked in together. So you basically have a Velarde potential move with IFL and Perfetti. Those are the only three players Rick Bonus is willing to touch right Pre, now. Pre-deadline. That's before, pre-deadline. Any, before any team major changes. And no injuries. So I have no problem with the, the whole young player gets demoted. I do think we're going so far off the deep end. With, with the trade talks already? Yeah, with he's a bum. We got to get rid of him. He's Nick Patan, yada, yada, yada. Settle the fuck down, people. Compare his age seasons to Mark Schleifley's age seasons. Yeah. For the first half of this season, you got a 21-year-old playing top six caliber hockey. Settle the fuck down here. Yeah, like... De- develop- me and Liz talked about Development is not linear. You don't rush to move this guy because of one bad stretch. The only way you do it is if you, you get, get a star. You get a star for term. But... Uh, so what do you think of the, the Rennie thing with... Perfetti coming in and out of the lineup. I don't love it. Like, this is a... Yeah, we're we're, we're walking on NHLs, I think. We were... This was something big in the Paul Maurice era where where your line had set roles and you were too good to be a fourth liner, but you weren't good enough to get in the lineup type of thing. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's... I think you should play your best 12 players. It, what I think is interesting now is... And I, I tweeted this out yesterday... Just due to play style, because that's what it's going to come down to. If or when Rutger signs out of college, does that bump him up ahead of Cole Perfetti in the depth chart right now? Because I think that's an interesting conversation, because I don't see a world where Perfetti's back in the top six by the end of the year. Yeah, so the one thing, if you look at Rick Bonus's doghouse historically, Cole Perfetti's in a lot of trouble. Good luck digging out of it. He's the one guy that... Uh, Grandpa Bones holds some grudges. It's hard to work your way out of that. So I do think Cole Perfetti's at risk of falling out of the lineup, which I do think is honestly insane. Um, it just it plays into the double standard stuff with me, and I do think there's areas he, he can improve. He's a 21-year-old NHL hockey player. But we're also talking about big picture here. 
a guy that's going to be a, or should be a piece of this franchise during this window and one of the young players they need to be one of those pieces growing in this window that you're really r- r- potentially ruining this relationship. Like that's a big concern. And those that that noise is getting <laughs> louder um this week, let's put it that way. Um at some point too, trust is a two way street. Yep. And this idea that you're gonna healthy scratch him for who? Rasmus Kupari or David Gustafson? Come on. Yeah, I think it's silly. C- c- come on. This idea that he can't play in a fourth line role and get more offense out of Baron, who has nine goals, Nemestikov, who we've seen around that, I have no problem with that being a fourth line in today's NHL. We need at least the the best teams in the league have at least three lines that are able to consistently contribute offensively. Not together. You're never going to get that. But you still need to be con- able to contribute offense throughout your lineup. Yep. If this is what gets him going, that's fine. But this idea of trading him now because of a small stretch is way too. Oh yeah, up. that's. I think that's silly. I don't think there's any he, merit. He's still the highest upside player, young player in this is this roster. Like th- comparing him to Brad Lambert right now is just comical to me. It is comical. Like it's it's falling in love with the new sexy toy. No, oh, that's that's what it is. That's and it's gonna happen in two years from now. There'll be someone above Brad Lambert. Like it, that's just kind of the hockey fan psyche. I think. Yeah, the the Rucker stuff is interesting because if he signs, they're gonna play him at least on the stretch. I don't think he'll be guaranteed a playoff spot, but they're gonna play him. Stylistically, we've talked about it. I think Bones will like the style. But I do think we got temper expectations on just the level of it. Well, that's that's okay. all I'm saying is stylistic. Like I think, <coughs> like I think Cole Perfetti right now is a better hockey player than Rucker McGrody is right 100%. now. I don't think it's a conversation. And I I, I had someone in uh, my mentions today who clearly misunderstood whatever yes. I was trying to say. It was actually comical. Well, when but you're a Logan Stanley fan, what do you expect? But I think there's a legit conversation to be had that given play style. And whether they're a year or two apart, that there is a chance that he comes in the lineup and takes Cole Perfetti's spot this year. I don't think it's the smartest thing in the world. Like I've been preaching the the Rucker McGrody or banging the Rucker McGrody drum pretty hard this year. I just think it's an interesting conversation, like to see where that ends up. And this is this could all change again in two weeks. Like we we don't know what this team's roster is going to look like after March eighth. Yeah, I think we all get to, get to become prisoners of the moment sometimes. I'm guilty for it to myself. No, oh, big time, yeah, you are. No, oh, 100% I am. But I think we have to take a much bigger view on the Cole Perfetti stuff than... Oh. I, I had someone suggest trading him for Sean Walker and Scott Lawton. Like, guys, like, really, let's settle, settle, settle down here. There might be three guys from his draft class I take over him right now. Yeah. Like, I, let's slow it, slow it down a bit here. I think this is, everyone's just getting a little antsy with the whole, um, between the news of the, the season tickets and everything, and wanting to land a big fish and him being a potential trading piece. I wouldn't risk six years of Cole Perfetti for one or two years of a, a couple average guys. Got a question for you. How many games this year do you think Cole Perfetti played over 15 minutes at 5-on-5? Five five? Two. Not even. One. So, I mean, you want more offense of a guy, too. You got to, like... I think that's part of my problem, too, is he's looking at the second line as the offensive line. The second line's got to score. They're playing through line minutes. I mean... You don't you don't get time to generate. Like, you, you're going to have good nights, but they're going to be less than... Nicky Lears is still this team's most efficient scorer. Play minutes. But let's... 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 Let's let's think on the Cole Perfetti trade stuff then. If he's not going to be in this lineup this year, what would you need to get in return for Cole Perfetti? Three or four years of an elite top six player. Agreed. It can't even be. I I was thinking about the Booch thing, but then it's only a year and a half. No, you need you need someone on top of Booch. You especially. And it's not like there's many names out right now. No, like at that level. There's there's. There's no names out right now at that level that I'm trading for that no. are publicly out. If a Clayton Keller becomes available, sign long term, yeah. That's a guy I would look to move him for. I don't expect him to come available before the deadline. Um, you need a upper echelon sixty seven or seventy plus point guy signed for term is what you need for trading a twenty one year old Cooper Fetty. Yeah, like the bar has or, to be so high. Here. Or a first pairing D man. I was gonna ask if that that would fit in because it would fit in for me. First not pair, not right a second D-man. pairing. A first pairing, preferably on the right side. 
that's that's it there there's no there's no other conversation to be had there it's a it's a first line caliber forward or first pairing d men Rasmus Anderson only signed to the end of next year yeah 4.3 though that's cheap uh I'm with you though yeah like you got to recognize the asset that Cole Perfetti is. He was a top 10 pick, seen very highly by... I mean, when our, when our guy this young is getting national media attention as part of potentially the, the breakout player of the year... And not playing enough ice time. Yeah. This is a player seen very high. And we've seen it. We saw him being a legit two-way impact player throughout the first half of this year. Let's, let's settle. And you got five more years of control of this. Like... Yeah, you you need let's settle. You you need a big big piece. Oh uh, yeah, I'm open to it. Like I don't think he's untouchable. I don't think anybody's untouchable. That's my mantra all the time. But you need a massive piece if you're moving Cole for Fetty. Yeah, I I'm with you on that. I think that's that. Do you want to get into the news of the day and then uh yeah, get into the week? Yeah, let's do that. So, obviously, tense week in Winnipeg. Mark Shipman sat down with Chris Johnson to talk about the need for the season ticket base to grow, um, for this to be sustainable. And a lot of it was around the corporate ticket yep, base yeah, yeah. because it's under 15%. I'll let you lead the way. I have a lot of different thoughts on this. Well, I just want to say, like, it's it's clear how many people don't have an athletic subscription. A lot of headline readers. A lot of headline readers talking about something that they clearly didn't read into. Because, I don't know about you, but when I read that article, it didn't leave any panic. It didn't leave any sour taste in my mouth. Yeah. It was actually a very well done on Mark Chipman side of things. I thought. Mm-hmm. I thought he handled it well. He adju- he addressed the issues that we've we've talked about from the start of the year. Uh, the Jets have failed on the corporate side of things, being a Canadian market only having fifteen percent corporate season tickets. Mm-hmm. And I've seen some horror stories on Twitter t- uh, in the past week. Um, one pretty big restaurant owner in Winnipeg was tweeting about how he was receiving cease and desists. From True North for having Jets ticket giveaways. I mean, what are you doing? Like, that is a very serious issue that I think the True North needs to look inwards and address. And I think that they're going to based off of Chipman's um, uh, demeanor in that interview. That was a lot of... He basically said, the fans have carried us for 10 years. We weren't in sales. We were in service. We didn't even bother with this corporate because we had this cash cow of people, um, wh- blah, 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 whatever. I thought he handled himself very well. I thought the public outcry was insane for what that article was. Yeah. But then you get the news that, that Gary Bettman's coming to town. It amplified it. And it amplifies things for sure. I know he goes to every um, every market once a year, but the timing on this could not have been worse. Yeah. And I, I, f- I thought his... Uh, presser day was pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. He's kind of a smug prick for most of it. <laughs> he always is, though. Yeah, I guess that's why people hate him. But fuck, the, like I, I thought he answered things quite well, and I think Jets fans should be in a very comfortable position. Hundred percent. Based off what, and we've talked about this, the True North owns downtown at this point. Mm-hmm. This team's not going anywhere. This team is so safe; it's insane. Mm-hmm. But. <laughs> the one the one thing that pissed me off is um it was probably the third or fourth straight question about the corporate season tickets yeah and and we both think that we could have got s- some more diversity in questions yeah. and i it's a hard job i don't want to yeah. criticize i think people have been criticizing the media way too much this year for the jobs that they've done 100 percent. i think our friend uh connor rapchuk had a great thread on it i don't know if it was earlier today or if it was yesterday yep about how they've been asking, but you can only ask the same question so many times. Like I, th- I think the media's done very well this year. Mm-hmm. But the one fucking thing was after the third or fourth question, he goes, "You know, it, it really shocks me how 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 bothered the city is right now. Like I didn't think I'd be coming into this. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Y- you you can't not understand why the city is panicking. Like you get an article f- a few days ago." Where most of the headlines are, is not going to work in the long haul. Blah blah blah. The Winnipeg's a, a broken fan base in the sense of losing the team in the '90s. You see this whole Arizona situation going on. I know what aboutism doesn't work, and it's it's stupid. But there's always going to be a part of a lot of fans here that hate that market, and they just want it to be gone, 
and they're going to hate when they see the team go move back again in a few years after they move now. But, like, are you kidding? Like, read the fucking room. Like, read the goddamn room and tell me that you don't understand. You're mystified at the at the feeling of the market. Like, are you kidding me? I, I actually loved everything about what Batman had to say today. Because I... Th- <laughs> so there was a lot of concern that he was going to come in and be the bad guy. And I think that would have played so poorly oh, in this market right now. It would have... That would have been, like, a real big nail, I think. As far as, like, winning people and stuff like that. And I do... I, I, I think you're right. Like, I, I think you're completely right. But for me, it calmed the situation seeing him, like, say those things as far... Even though he was, like, arrogant and surpri- mystified, like, clearly bullshit. But I actually think that helped bring the temperature down if you can see through it a little bit because he's basically saying, like, there's no concern here from the league. And he ended it with saying there is absolutely not any concern with the Board of Governors about this franchise. He talked up the idea. It's been a thriving hockey market. Every team goes through downspouts, and they expect this to rebound. Um, he says how committed to the ownership is. Obviously, having Chipman and Thompson, like you mentioned, the Winnipeg Jets, as this business continues to grow in Winnipeg, is becoming like a front-facing attraction for all the downtown development going up. That's what it is. This this business is set up. Thanks to True North, a lot better than years past. They own the rink. There is a lot of government subsidies going on as well. They own eight buildings downtown. Yes, and I think the one thing that... And when I, when I saw the article, I put out like a seven and a half minute video on TikTok. Got a lot of praise, actually. I was pretty impressed. Yeah. Seven and a half minutes. Yeah, People just, watched it? Yeah. The, the longer <laughs> video is apparently doing pretty well on there. Um, just kind of highlighting what different aspects are going on because I hate the narrative that it's this market. When this market had blue collar people sell this place out for 10, 10 years. Yeah, we had more regular season fans tickets per capita than any other market in Canada. More regular hockey fans have gone to games on their dime, on their back, than any rink in the league. When you're looking at most rinks have 40 to 50% corporate and we're under 15. Yeah, do it's, the math. it's insane. And we're not a high population. What are we? I thought the census was 800,000. Yeah. Like people. And you're going to get that from the Toronto's of the world yeah. where the, the big markets where, oh, it's Winnipeg, whatever. But this fucking team has been carried by a fan base of regular people for 10 years. To, for, what is it, 14 years now. Yeah. But, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, the, like, I thought everything Batman had to say publicly. He's a straight shooter. If he wanted to come give a lecture, he would have came and gave a lecture. Uh, I like Sean getting right into it right off the bat. I thought the first answer, Batman talked for like two minutes about what's all going right here. And him and Daly talked about seeing it as a model organization from a business perspective as far as how it's run. I did, I did like Murat's question about the revenue sharing. And the Board of Governors, yeah. Yes. And they talked about it. there's some years the Jets have taken revenue sharing. There's some years it's not. But that's why it's in place. Especially for smaller markets. To yeah. keep competing in the cap. Like, you don't want to be t- taking big... I, I don't know the formula. I'm not going to pretend to know the formula. But the fact that they flat out said the board of governors is not worried about this market. It's also time for this market to get a bit of a, a backbone and a bit of confidence here. This market did something pretty spectacular for 10 years. Yeah. And, you know, tough economic times. A lot of good feedback. I wrote that 14 tweet thread just about... We do have to stop doing the what about Arizona thing. Because if, there, if there's problems in this market, it's on this community to address. We, we can't be looking elsewhere. Well, it's, and it's on the ownership to address. And it is 100%. It's on ownership. And a lot of this is on ownership and corporate Winnipeg figuring some stuff out together. This is going to be something solved within Winnipeg. But what I thought after reading the athletic article, knowing like how the business is set up, my first thought was, and I think Gary Bettman emphasized that today was when we talk about sustaining this for the long haul, the Jets are a cap team. Yeah. To continue being a cap team, they need the building sold out. If not, it's like what we talked about last summer when we were potentially going into rebuild. You have to adjust the business. You'll be spending less. You'll have a less quality product. Maybe that means something for tickets in those spells. I don't think this team's ever going to try and rebuild, and they've done a a good job keeping competitive. It's just can they take it over the top yeah, of my cup? It's That's be. where the middle ground is where they've ended up. That was 
that's where this business is talking from a sustainability aspect is if you want to sustain trying to be a top contender, the building's going to need to be full. They're, 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 they're going to they're gonna be here. There's too much infrastructure for them to leave. And there's too much money for the NHL to make going expansion. Yeah, yeah. The the, the relocation versus expansion isn't uh, isn't what the the NHL clearly wants. Yeah, they're gonna have to with Arizona, I think. But they're, they're it gone is what this it summer. is. I'm pretty sure they're gone this summer. I think we'll stop talking about the Arizona thing this summer. I think it's gonna be Salt Lake. Uh, it might be Houston. That's a really interesting one because Fertitta's now making it known. The Fertitas are yeah. like the brothers. Yeah, that own the Rockets. And the interesting they thing, they own the Rockets. They used to own the UFC. Um, it might, I'm not sure if it's the same guy, but it might be, but he owns, so the talk I had heard nationally was that, cause he owns the building, but r- the rumors I had heard before, at least in Canada were that he didn't want to own the team. He would let them rent. Hmm. I'm hearing the, like I was reading an article from the Houston Chronicle. He wants to own the team for his building. And it sounds like he prefers relocation over expansion, where Salt Lake's made it very clear they're they open to whatever expand, gets yeah. them in. So I'm kind of wondering if we see Houston, who's going through a big stadium reno, to be able to suit hockey, apparently. Do you think Texas has the... Oh, yeah. Ch- Texas has the chops. For, for two hockey teams? I do. That's that's huge. For Dallas us. has been a massive win for the Pe- league. People are going to hate it, but that's huge for the NHL. Terrifying for the Central Division. You have the Fertitta spending money on the Coyotes? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's something. One thing I found interesting, and I... I didn't quite understand. If the league's going to a centralized draft, how is Winnipeg going to get a draft, and what does that look like? Because that that was conversation, and it's been conversation for a while now. Yeah, we might be in tough on that one. Like, <clears throat> like they've been talking about it for years for that for once that hotel is done. Yeah. But if it's going to centralize, what's the point? Because you're not bringing in the the people anymore. Yeah, that's a tough point. Because I would like to see an an NHL event here would be pretty and cool. It, it would have to be a draft. They're not sending the NHL to Winnipeg in February. It's it's not happening. Yeah, it never would. It'd be so dumb. J- June is beautiful, or was it? When's the draft? July first. Uh, and no, it's June thirtieth because July first is free agency. Right? They did that last year, but normally it's a week before. Okay, but anyways, yeah, it would have to be. So that that'll be interesting to look out for. Um, the one thing I would have liked to hear Gary Bevan talk about, and this is what was unfortunate about going down the same line of questioning even though I thought Gary made it very clear, like there's nothing to worry about here. I would have liked to hear, because this was about the NHL business and where it's moving, and then the story kind of took over. I would have liked to hear what the NHL is continuing to try and do to be less ticket dependent. It's getting scary too. That's like, what I'm, like There was an article, uh, Huss brought it up on Winnipeg Sports Talk, where Boston's having the same issues. As far as it's getting priced out of the common field. Yo, I, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, and like it's become a thing. And then I was having a discussion with someone when talking about the Jets. It came up, oh, Green Bay could support an NFL team. Do you know, did you know from their TV contract alone, NFL teams make more than the salary cap? Yeah, I uh, I, I saw the same problem. thread you were reading through, and I, I did some looking up on it. It's interesting, but... That's what I'd like to know more The NHL, like, what do you do? Do you go direct to consumer? I'm not sure. Because, like, Bally Sports failed. Yeah. Amazon bought up a bunch of them, though, eh? Yeah. The, the direct-to-consumer has worked out pretty well in Arizona and Vegas, too. Interesting enough. Um, they've reported some good stuff there. It's an, it's an interesting development right now with where the industry is at, so we'll we'll see more of that. That's just something I would have liked to hear more about. Unfortunately, we didn't. You know what? That's a, that's enough of the, the deeper stuff today. Let's get into the week ahead. Yeah. Game's starting soon, too. Yeah. George's got to get out of here. Uh, Blues tonight, LB and Net versus Winnipeg native Joel Hofer. Who do you got? I'm going to go off script from the episode. Mark Scheifele's historically played pretty damn well against St. Louis. I think we see some life out of that top line. I'm going to take Winnipeg 4-2. Yeah, I'm taking Winnipeg tonight too. Um, I'm going to go 3-1. Dallas Thursday. They're, they're, okay, this is... I've been waiting for a measuring stick game. Vancouver happened, and then it's been the slog. Dallas, Winnipeg, in Dallas. Who do you got? That's going to be a good one. Uh, that is an all-time measuring stick. I think Dallas, despite records right now, I think Dallas is the cream of the crop of the West. I think so, too. I, I take them over Vancouver. I take them over Winnipeg. I take them over Edmonton, Vegas, whoever. I'm going to go and say Dallas in a 3-2 slugfest of a game. 
Can you believe the Dallas Stars, this team that we're talking about as a Western contender, had a breakout from a 21-year-old defenseman helping push them, and now we're calling up a, a rookie and putting him into their top nine? Can you? Uh, you can do that? It's crazy. Well, to be Logan Snagel was leading the AHL in points. I'm just saying. I'm, su- I'm surprised you can do that. I didn't think that was allowed for contending teams. Anyways, I got Dallas winning that one, too. I'll go... I'll go 4 3. I'll keep it tight. And then Saturday, we got uh, the Jets in Carolina. Morning game, too. Eh? Yeah, 11 30 a.m. Uh, we'll go, I'll go Jets in this one. I'll like, go 2 and 1 on the rest of the week. I'll go Carolina. I'm going to go 1 and 2 week. I think these 5 on 5 woes are going to bite them. Two questions before we leave, just quickly, because the deadline's coming up. Um,. Let's start with the first line. How many games in a row do you think it would take before they make a switch here, if any at all? At least until the deadline. Okay. And as of today, what do you think they're adding? Oh, they're adding a top six forward. I think um, I think Chipman sounding the bell there. You wanted to get I, into I think that's, yeah. Final topic here before we fuck off. Um, I think the, the Jets org sounding the bell is is good signs for what's ahead for the deadline because if you want to go and show your community that you're serious about this team and you want people back in the building you better make a fucking splash of the deadline you better and and if they're hurting for money two three playoff rounds that's huge as it is but if you sound the alarm we need more people we need more people and you trade a, a sixth for a seventh d-man and that's it what does that show potential fans that are looking to buy tickets i i don't see how after as as much as i praise chipman for the way he handled that article i don't see how you could put that out two and a half weeks before the deadline and not make a serious i think you're onto something too because i had a i had a back and forth with someone this week on it and they mentioned like the jets aren't gonna invest the jets aren't gonna mess they're taking the losses whatever this within the last six months locked up connor hellebuck Locked up Mark Scheife. He spent over $100 million there, knowing the attendance was coming in. They were well aware of what was gonna, the beginning of the year was going to look like. They locked up Mino Niederreiter at Christmas. And then they traded a first for Sean Monahan early. I think, I, I think you're right. I think there's still a, a move coming here. The spidey senses tell me it's going to be a smaller move for Matt Dumba just because that's what I had heard a month ago. And Murat's now putting that in his article. But I think you're right. I, I just can't see how they don't make some kind of bigger. I think Dumbo would have to be a secondary move. Uh, they're making a big move up front. I think they. I think they absolutely have to. I think that's gonna become the priority. I once had thought it was gonna be an upgrade on Mason Appleton. I am less confident in that as it's the days go by. It's now gonna be an upgrade on Alex Ifalo on that Sean Monahan line. Yeah. And maybe at that point we see some movement within the top six when Bones trusts all six players involved. I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt it. But yeah, that that's it for me though. Like I, I, I think you see a top six upgrade, and then if there's room and there's a, the right deal, I think you see a upgrade on Pionk on the right side. On I fucking hope so. I I need a Pionk upgrade to feel safe. I I need it. Yep. And there's something to be said about they're still having a trial for their six D spot going into the deadline. Yeah, that's that's not a good sign. And for me, nishmit has been a clear step ahead. I I feel more safe with Nishmit. All right, well, the game's about to get started, so we're going to get the hell out of here. Yeah, time to watch them hockey. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be back next week. Thank you all for your support. And, hey, let's keep these discussions going. Yeah, appreciate it. This has been a Top Line Media production.